going live. I'll be checking the audio. Laura's, Laura's not to be found, but we got moderators and shit. Do you guys know or not until you turn it on? There might be some in there. We are live, ladies and gentlemen. Cosmography Alive, the Randall Carlson podcast. We're all back from trips. We have more trips coming up, and uh, we're just sitting here talking with each other, getting everything ready. Hope you guys are ready for another live stream. Sorry, by the way, about the live stream we scheduled last time and then skipped out on. We had plan changes things happen you know stuff changes that fast happens. that's right but we are here glad to be with you guys brad is horse welcome everybody he said the steelers Thank won here with us. <laughs> I, was, I went to the steelers game yesterday a big surprise uh went with a friend and uh yelled my lungs out so this is what i got yeah and they won that's great they suck but they won yesterday <laughs> <laughs> Randall. Sir, yes. Randall's still doing research, folks. You can tell he's still pulling things up. You can see this. Yeah, well, changing. there's been a few interesting things. Yeah. Yeah. This um still getting my head wrapped around the specifics of it, but the evidence, you know, Ken Tankersley has come out, led that, gave the uh the uh the paper on the Hopewell burst. Hmm. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah. Southern Ohio. Uh huh. Yeah, so that's uh, pretty interesting, and uh, thought we could look at that for a minute. Uh, well, yeah, that's something that's something we can start introducing too. Uh, um, you know, because he's he's been confirmed as a speaker. You you kind of brought it up, but yeah, we may get into that. Um, it's eight months away still, but uh, we we previously talked about the uh, cosmic conference. It's now the cosmic summit. Brad, and can you uh, get your mic a little closer, maybe? Well, people it's, are saying you're quiet. It was, it, it was my I'm not. Oh, okay, I'm never mind. Really, I got this though, buddy. Okay, Kyle's handling it. Never mind. Kyle, thank you. Yeah, because I'm not. I don't have a place to mount it to, so it's it's sitting on my table right. versus up in the air. Okay, sorry. What were you saying? Thank you, thank you, Kyle. Well, I was just starting to build up to the uh, the Asheville event coming up next year. We would talked about maybe it was going to happen in the spring, but uh, we changed venues just in case we have a huge turnout of people a uh, new place there will handle up to 1600 people so that's crazy but it uh, we had to change the date so now uh it's going into june so we've mid-june we're going to have a, the cosmic summit uh and ken tankersley that randall just started talking about there is going to be one of the speakers ah excellent uh, but yeah randall's confirmed and graham hancock and um george howard uh the Cosmic Tusk and uh, Comet Research Group and Martin Sweatman, uh, Johanna James, Bright Insight Jimmy. Yep. Um, it's going to be a cool crowd and uh, and good stuff. So we're going to talk about catastrophism primarily. Uh, it's going to be the Cosmic Summit 23 in Asheville, June. I believe it's 15 to 17, but we'll clarify that. But yeah, more more to come on that one. Yeah, Ben's going to be there, right? Ben, oh, yeah. Uncharted yeah. X. That's yeah. right. I might be there. We'll see. We want we want you there, bud. <laughs> Drag your Texas ass north. <laughs> Bring Kyle while you're at it. <laughs> hey man, I'm I'm there, dude. I'm sweeping the floors. No, that's right. Kyle's got <laughs> Our custodial duties. That's custodial. right. <laughs> I am a master of the custodial arts. <laughs> hey, Maybe I see I see super chats already rolling in. Thanks, Ian England. Five bucks. Appreciate that, buddy. And Bruce, beer money, fifty dollars. My man. Yeah. Bruce checked in. He All said right, he had, Bruce. He yeah. said he had a question for us this time. So yeah. Thank you, Bruce. He says, Love question, you, younger Dryas, Comet or the Sun? And when will Ben Davidson be on Cosmographia? That's two questions, Bruce. Why does it have to be or? Right. Could it be both? Yeah, that's, I tend to, you know, well, maybe we should get into that at some point, uh, even today, if I can pull up some of the relevant research. Well, showing... and then also we're going to, I'm sorry, Randall. <laughs> well, yeah, that was it pretty much if I can pull up the relevant research. Okay. Well, yeah, just as far as the, uh, you know, the younger driest catastrophe impact, uh, whatever it's going to end up being, we're definitely adding to the research, but, uh, you're going to do a live stream about the cosmic origins of the day of the dead. So yeah. It's very possible that the the younger Dryas uh, 
global yes. catastrophe is it plays plays a part in why why we still uh have a halloween and a day of the dead really uh, as a global it's not a celebration but it is commemorating uh you know a, a probably a very terrible global event well yeah i put quite a bit of scattered information about this out there over the last few years but what I thought I'd do this 30th, the 30th, October 30th, the day before Halloween, is do just sort of a coherent presentation of the of the of the core material, linking a lot of things together because there is probably a connection between Halloween and the Younger Dryas event. And that connection would be what? For those of you guys that have been hopefully paying attention oh you want some what is the connection the chat <laughs> what is the anybody what is the connection oh. then between the potential connection between halloween and the younger dryas kyle i was waiting for somebody in the chats to <laughs> throw down but they're on like a 45 second delay yeah should we I wait was born in may so i'm connected so i i know already you can say it uh well, two words, three words. <laughs> I'll give a, let's see, what can I give you a hint? I mean, uh, I want to guess, but, you know, I'm so scared of being wrong. <laughs> no, it's okay. I, I will not chastise you. Well, I, Tung, I, Tunguska was one of them, but that's the, that's the summer. Yeah, I was thinking of the October, the month of October. Does that have anything to do with yeah, it? Yeah, you're talking about the Torrid Meteor Stream? You yeah, got it. You go. That's it. Go. Yeah. Torrid Meteor Stream. Okay. Yeah. Well, the, so, chat's, um, the chat's also getting it. Torrid meteor shower. Oh, they got a bunch of answers. Yeah, meteors in October. Comet streams. Mammoth methane. That's a good answer. Yeah, that's that's it. <laughs> mammoth, yeah, maybe. Mammoth maybe. I, I I don't know. I, you know the tours and then the and then the connection with the Pleiades because the Pleiades are yeah. directly straight up at that time of year. Yeah. Yeah. So that's we're gonna get into all. Did of I go that, too but, far? Well, yes, you did, but uh oh. <laughs> but Dial that's it back, okay. Brad. <laughs> cats out cats out of the bag. <laughs> the cat. You mean this might have something to do with Leo? Mm. And the Leonids? Might. Perhaps, yes. That wasn't me, that was you. Okay, so <laughs> we know that the Tard Meteor Stream peaks the uh the autumn tards peaks late October, early November, right? So we're going to kind of get in, we're going to look at the structure of that whole TARD system because that's the TARD system and understanding that and it's perhaps its influence and role in the recent geological, archaeological, paleontological history of this planet is likely profound. So the more we understand the structure of that system, the more, the better we're going to be positioned to understand a lot of these events. This thing that I was, that's, I found very interesting recently when we mentioned earlier, Ken Tankersley, who is going to be at the cosmic summit, uh, wrote this paper and the paper, um, Oh, let's see. No wonder I, keep, I will get used to having this second monitor monitor sooner or later. Um, so the paper has to do with the Hopewell, uh, yeah, now well, that's extinction of the dinosaurs. Here we go. The Hopewell airburst event. So one of the things that we have been very interested in for many years now is the whole phenomena of monumental earthwork architecture in America. And the potential explanation and story behind the creation of these tremendous structures of earth and would have included wood at one time, you know, the wood has essentially mostly decayed away, but they were magnificent structures of earth and wood. And, you know, it kind of fits into that whole pattern of people in ancient times being so highly motivated to create these amazing structures all over the planet, North America's, version of this these the ancient structures is the earthworks the monumental earthworks and you know i i had always suspected that there was a connection uh, particularly because of the 
fact of Serpent Mound being on the rim of an ancient astrobling. And that led me to think that maybe there was a link between the Hopewell culture and what was going on in the sky. And of course, what we see is over and over again is the orientation of these structures is always astronomical. Again, we find that all over the ancient world. Every continent, with the possible exception of Antarctica, but who knows about Antarctica, but other all the other continents all have this evidence of these tremendous structures built between anywhere between 1,500 and 5,000 years ago or longer, much longer perhaps in some cases, and they all seem to have certain consistent factors, one of them being this astronomical orientation. Uh, way beyond what subsistence farmers are going to need to know when to plant their crops. They needed it for farming. <laughs> well, they certainly could use it for farming. <laughs> but, I mean, that kind of information can be derived from a stick in the ground. You don't yeah, need yeah. to pile up, you know, a couple of hundred thousand cubic uh, yards of earth, you know, and, and you don't need to enshrine the 18.6 year lunar cycle to know when you plant your crops. So obviously there's something else going on there. And that's one of the mysteries that we're trying to solve. I'm going to go ahead and pull up. Yeah. We actually discussed a little bit about this on our, on one of our recent shows about the, the problem with archeologists or the academics just seeming to, you know, just kind of brush off the, interest that the ancients had in in precise astronomy as just like oh well they needed it for planting crops and well yeah kind of, i mean that's ridiculous yeah 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 that's basically ridiculous so um anyways this hopewell paper is is forging a link now and and let's see here let me go back to this i'm just i'm pulling up something else here um all right well, meanwhile, while you're, pull, while you're pulling that up, I can name off a couple of people who are donating here. Yeah, good, good. That'd be great. Uh, GEC812 gave $2. Thank you very much. Uh, Daryl Roberts, 4 bucks for coffee, looks like. Daryl Roberts, an old friend of mine. Yeah. From years ago. I Good to know you're still out there, Daryl. Welcome back. Brian. Uh, Brian Offerdahl, 5 bucks says, Randall, you're doing important work, and I do appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, who was that from? That was from Brian. Thanks, Brian. Appreciate it. I'm trying. It gets challenging sometimes. I'm trying, but... And I'm also trying to have fun doing it. Yeah. Yep. Um, Appreciate the appreciation. <laughs> <laughs> that too, yes. So, do we want to talk about the... Or have we talked about our recent Scablands trip? I tell you, there was yeah. one thing in there that I can't wait to show people. And that is, you know, Ben got this drone footage of these gigantic potholes. Oh, yeah. They're, they're next to um, uh, Deep Lake. Uh, that is amazing. I didn't know oh, that yeah. was there oh, yeah. uh -huh. uh, before this trip. But these potholes, yeah, we'll have that to show people coming up. Uh but yeah, those potholes were amazing. And Russ, you went up there and in, into the bottom of one of them, didn't you? There was a there was a hole through the cliff wall that you could climb through. Yes, yeah. Jesse and I went through there. It was really really interesting. Yeah, uh, walked uh, walked the path on the other side of the lake, and there's a there's a cliff wall, and then you can kind of climb up, and there's a little like a puncture through the cliff wall. The cliff wall is apparently thin right there, and you climb through, and you're in the bottom of an enormous pothole which is apparently part of a swarm of them that been a swarm. Yeah. yeah it's a swarm, a whole yeah. swarm. So, so that's I'm part sure of you... that five mile wide complex, uh, where dry falls is on the, the Western edge where the monocline was, but yeah, it extends East for five miles. So yeah, the, the Canyon there, that deep Lake is in is part of it. And then up on that, that shelf is where those potholes are. So yeah, that that's going to be cool to see. Yeah. Yeah, that whole that whole area is just so freaking tortured. Um, it is. It is. Um, I'm gonna do a little little graphic here. Um, I'm gonna make a little sketch. You want to draw on the whiteboard? 
<laughs> well, I could try that. Wanna, Let's give it a shot. You want to try that? that? Hopefully, I won't embarrass myself with a bunch of uh, preschool-looking scrawls, but let's give it a shot so yeah, down there at the bottom you should see i the, see it yeah. whiteboard i yeah. click that up and then i click new whiteboard i guess I, have i used i don't think I've i don't used know the let's Once give it a shot or twice we're doing it live thing. folks let's see what <laughs> <happens>. okay <laughs> <clears throat> all right uh okay so there should be a pencil there okay there it is yeah. let's see if we can do this i don't see anything yet well the the pencil needs to be selected yeah it is Click on the pencil yeah. there. I did, and I'm drawing. Oh. Well, let's see. Who can oh, see ah, what you're well, I'm seeing it. it. Yeah, yeah, I see it. Okay, I see it. You're doing good. Oh. Keep going. It says I'm co-editing. So, um, yeah, do I have video recording permission? Because, crap, I'm not recording. Oh, right. Uh-oh. Oops. Well, we'll fix that. Well, I can't do it yet. Let's see. You guys are seeing some inside baseball here. All right, we had other Brad, you have pre-show discussions yeah, going on. Permission, yeah. Us. Okay, Randall's drawing. Whoa, I see that. I see that. Yes. All okay, right. Yes. The Colking the Colking action. Is this a Tesla coil? Um... Recording in progress. <laughs> okay, let's Inside. see. Oops. <clears throat> well, let's say I should add a little. Oops. Oh, I see. That kind of works. Yeah. Yeah, I see what you're doing there. Yeah. All right, so we got the cliff. Now, now this out here is part of the coulee that has Deep Lake in it. Let's say this is Deep Lake over here. We can't see your cursor, though. Yeah. Weird, we can't yeah. see my cursor? I don't. Well, let's see. Who can see what you share? Everyone who has access to this whiteboard, including people in the meeting, can save things you share here and share them with apps and no, others. We, we so, can see the drawing. We just can't see your we can't see your cursor for something. Yeah, you're gonna have to draw arrows for us when you're talking about stuff, I guess. I don't know. Oh, let's see here. Okay. Do you see a cursor now? No. Nope. I don't. Okay, so uh but you do see the drawing. Yes. Oh yeah. Yeah, we yes. see the drawing. Okay. So we've got a little it says got a little uh option there for uh, an arrow but you're not seeing the arrow right that's okay just describe it okay on the left um, we're looking at the at deep lake okay so deep lake is out here i was going to see if i could make that do they have color can you use color in this M thing maybe that little circle that little blue circle maybe yeah blue circle so your deep lake is like left? 350 feet deep right it's really narrow yeah uh, but it's super deep because it's just like a, a sheer cliff and then there's probably a 180 200 foot um cliff on top of that above the water so it's a it's a lot of sudden erosion to be over 500 feet right there yeah okay well uh <laughs> if we look damn i can't there's gotta be a way to get that pointer going here hmm. a line a text a sticky note erase oh there's color oh okay let's see if i can make this work it's it guys it says i'm co-editing so does that mean anything does randall's probably should, means you can also draw exclusively on there. there we go we see some water there showing anybody's anybody's cursor so that would be the lake down there okay Deep Lake. Now, Deep Lake is the remnant of the flow that was actually way up here. Right? That's because sad. remember, the, the, the potholes are on top of the cliff. Right. Yep. So the water had to be deep on top of the cliff. Rushing over the top of the cliff was probably at least a couple hundred feet deep. Okay. So, so this thing here that Kyle facetiously asked if it was a tesla coil that represents the colking the the vortex so what it does is the vortex drills this hole into the rock and this and then this little down here on the left side you've got this pinnacle coming up because the what this represents is the the <laughs> pothole is right next to the edge of the cliff it's up on this shelf yes that's right um so um and what happened was 
it was eroding through. If, if it had kept on going, this pinnacle here, the 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 wall between the coulee and the pothole would have been eliminated. Yeah. That's and it right. would have just been a big sort of a scallop in the side of the cliff. But what happened was it did start eating its way through. And that's what I'm going to try to color in here. That's the tunnel. That would be the tunnel. Yeah. Right. So, whoops. Boy, this is hard to control. Well, it was worth a shot. It's entertaining. Well, it's entertaining. Kind of gets the idea. So you had this, <laughs> you had this pile of scree piled up against the base of the cliff that you guys climbed up. Yeah. And then you went through this hole into the bottom of the pothole, this little cave, this tunnel. Well, the tunnel was the start of the erosion of this pinnacle here. Now, imagine that tunnel, if it had enlarged somewhat, 20 or 30 feet, say 20 feet, you know what you would have ended up with? A rock bridge. Oh, yeah. Right. So that's the first thing I really started thinking about when I'm looking at that there. And, you know, there is up, it's up on private land. I saw it in one of the guidebooks, so it's not really accessible without contacting the owners and it didn't mm -hmm. give any contact information, but up near Grand Coulee, there is a rock bridge uh -huh. that would have been clearly the result of the catastrophic flooding and the turbulence. Which now brings me back to the question I've had over and over again in my mind as I'm touring the Southwest, looking at the arches and the rock bridges out there, how they were formed. Because if we look at those rock bridges now, they aren't being created. Where, where in the world today do we see rock bridges in the processes, or even the early processes of formation? Arches, where? We don't know what we do see, though is that the existing arches and rock bridges are being slowly destroyed. Yeah. So that then brings up the question of, is it possible that a lot of the erosion that we see, this extensive erosion in the Southwest, in Utah, in uh, Nevada, in Arizona, in New Mexico, is it possible that some of that erosion is catastrophically created. Mm. And I'm definitely leaning towards yes. thinking yes. Yeah. Definitely possible. Yeah. No doubt. Yeah. All right. Shall we end the, I, I had uh, end pointed this out on, on the tour when we were looking at the, uh, the big pothole over there in uh, Drumheller channels that, you know, the, the water flow has to be consistent and the channel geometry has got to remain the same or wherever that whirl with that whirlpool, that eddy or coal king is going to move around. So if it's extremely deep, right, that means the, the amount of water flowing through there was, was pretty consistent for it to drill a, a deep hole or a series of deep holes, or, or maybe that's, maybe that's why there's a series of them because it was moving and that eddy was shifting. Hmm. Yeah, I'd like to see what Ben's got. I don't I don't know exactly what it looks like up there. Uh, let's see here. Well, I'm I'm sure there must be a way to share so people can see the uh Jeff says you you should sell that whiteboard print right there. <laughs> Who says that? Our buddy Jeff. <laughs> Yeah, well, a, I tell you what, you think cat. I could get 50 or 100 grand for it? <laughs> you might be able to. Yeah, yeah. I need uh I'll sign it. There's a big spot in the middle for Randall's, you know, mug. <laughs> Just plant yourself right in there. Here we go. Look at this. I'm signing it. All right, he's going to sign it, folks. You can screenshot it and hang it up in your house. It, I don't have my uh my typical <laughs> That's, that's better than what's on a lot of parents' refrigerators. That's what they were saying. They're going to hang it on the fridge like a proud parent. <laughs> okay. How do I get out of here now? Uh, down at the bottom, the whiteboard. Click it. Probably click that thing again. I don't know. Oh. Uh, or maybe we can end it. Let's see. Yeah, you might have to do it. <sighs> Uh, that's a beauty. There we go. Hey, oh, oh. You, didn't, you didn't show the cliff that we dove off of, though, so damn it. <laughs> oh, yeah. Where were the people jumping right. off the cliff, Randall? We, we didn't dive. We cliff jumped, and, and <laughs> Kyle cliff flipped. Yeah, Kyle was doing backflips again. <laughs> Honk. Hey, man. Kyle. It yeah, awesome. feels so good. 
<laughs> well, let's okay. So tell you what, let's show. We get that on the drone too. Let's show oh, people what we, where where we were. Back flipping off the cliff. Oh, that's Billy Clap. We want Deep Lake. Okay. Um, all right. I'm gonna Deep Lake. All right. Screen share. Google mapping. I'm gonna do a screen share. And then we have plenty of questions when you're ready to start getting to them. Okay. Sure. Um, again, these were great trips. Awesome people as always. Uh, we're doing it again in May. So. You want to see these scab lands up close and personal with us yourself? Um, get on the list. It's probably going to fill up fast because we're only doing one one trip this time. That's right. All right. So here, are we seeing this digital map? Yep. Yep. Okay. This is this yep. is the Dry Falls Cataract Complex. So this is Deep Lake. So these potholes were along the south uh, rim of Deep Lake, and right here, if I zoom in, I. For some reason, it's losing resolution. Yeah, but it looks like it's it right there. The... I'll stop it right here. So, okay, is your is here's the trailhead, and then the trail goes along here, and you're on this flat area, and then th this is the cliff right here, and you can actually look at this. This would be this is probably the pothole right here. Now you are yeah. seeing my cursor, right? Yes. Yep. Yes. Yeah. So this is probably one of the potholes right here. Mm. You know what might be? Let me see if I can go over here to the satellite view. There, there. Look at that. Look at those potholes. Look at that right there. Yeah. That that's probably the one right. Well, let's see. That's no, gotta be let, it. That's no, that's no, because that's down on the. It's off to the to your right yeah. there. I I think this is it way over here. Over here. Yeah, yeah the shadows throwing me off there. Yeah, the shadows are throwing me off too. Well, um, see the see the two uh, see the two little white areas next right to here? the lake. Yeah, it's just down below that, right by the wall. It's close to the wall. It's like right there. This hole. Oh, there, there it is. That makes yeah. sense now. Where it's where the cliff <clears throat> is protruding outwards, upwards. Right here. Yes, oh, I think that's okay. it. Okay. Oh, right here. Yeah. I think this is it. Yeah, I think that's it. Yeah, it doesn't show up that well here. I've seen. Uh, yeah, it's the oh. shadow is coming from. There's another from the higher south. cliff behind it. Yeah, yeah. So it's weird looking, but that's it. That's yeah, it. yeah. And there it was a giant pile of scree on that northern side, facing Deep Lake, that you can actually yeah. climb up and get out yeah. of the pothole. But the rest of the pothole wall is a sheer cliff. But it's great. You can from that picture, you can see there's five or six of them in that. Yeah. Let's try what, let's see what we can see with Google Earth. Now, right. when I shift from Google Maps to Google Earth, is it following me or we will I need to it? do yeah. it? Yeah, sir. Oh, we see it. Oh, that's cool. Still all good. right. You're yeah. in the same browser. Yeah. Okay. All right. Same browser. Okay. So that's the key right there. Okay. Yeah. So let's yeah. see what Google Earth will show us. Oh, yeah. Look at that group of them. Wow. There are a bunch up there. Yeah. Let's try 3D and see what happens. Yeah, go well, Go left even before well south from there. Okay, yeah, now look at here. That one, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That one's behind the one we climbed into though. I'm and that's sure. still within the channel. Yeah, yeah, that's got to be it right there, there, Randall. It's the right, one you climbed into is this right one. there. Yeah, and it's huge, yeah. but so that one next yeah. to it is must be absolutely enormous. Yes. Yeah, but so right there where the where the cliff protrudes outwards is where the hole is through the wall. Yep. Yeah. Let's see if I can't spin it around. Now they really show. Look at here's one here. Oh yeah, look at that. Look at this. So the one you climbed into must have been. I'm guessing the tunnel is right in here. That's right. Yeah. At the base of the cliff. You climbed through, and you think that's right? Yes. That looks okay. Like it. Yep. Wow. I had a panorama from the inside of that pothole I was looking for, and I it's not on my phone, so I, I don't know what happened. Must have accidentally deleted it. 
Look at this. Yeah, those are the ones I was seeing before yeah. you get yeah. to the lake. Yeah, a bunch of them, yeah. yeah. Man. And, and then just So Ben the, flew over that those. with the drone? Yes. Oh, dude. But yeah, there's, man. Yeah, so you can see here's the trail. Come here, the trailhead's right here. You follow the trail up. And yeah, it must it this this is must be the one you guys went inside. Or was it it's that this? right there? Yeah, it's right That's there. That's it yeah. right there. That's yeah. The, yeah. So yeah, here's the scree right here. Right. And there we go. So you can't see it, but it. there's a tunnel right there going into the thing. Yeah. Now, as I zoom out, I mean, look at the entire landscape. Yeah. You know, the entire landscape was submerged under these unbelievably turbulent waters. Oh, look at here now. Look at there. That's what I'm thinking is as many times we've been out there and it's, you know, there's thousands and thousands of square miles though. I mean, there, there's just evidence everywhere and we haven't seen all of it. So yeah, there's, there's still this constant, constant sense of awe. Yeah. Yeah. Know, of, of how, how erosive this water and how much of it there, sh there must have been to create all, create all this just, just destruction everywhere. And look, look at here. You, now you can see. There's like the a pot. lot. These There's cataract totally falls cool. forming at the edge of that pothole right there at the yeah. nose of the cliff. Right here. Yes. You mean? Yeah. yeah. And then look at this here. Right. You can it's see. another one. Yeah. Oh, Green Lake's looking a little yellow. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing. There's so much there we haven't seen. We don't see. I know. Yep. Yeah. Uh, we need to do a, a plane ride over it. Yeah. We need to make that an option on the next trip. Optional, optional flyover. <laughs> so here's your rock blade. And you can see here, look at, uh, is that Perch Lake? Yeah. Right here. That would be a pothole. And like Brad was saying, look, you can almost see like there's a smaller circular feature here that's intruding upon the larger one. And these would have been plunge pools from the water pouring over would have just eaten holes in the, in the bedrock floor. And then when you go north of here, you come up to Steamboat Rock. And interestingly, we've got two tributary channels leading into the Coulee. This is Northrop Canyon. And let's see, I think this is Foster Canyon. Uh, Barker over there. Oh, that's Barker. Okay. So clearly, like you wouldn't have had this down cutting uh, forming Northrop Canyon without, an, without Grand Coulee already having been eroded to its present depth. And look here, I guess this is, this is outwash, I assume. It looks from, like it, yeah. From the formation of Northrop Canyon. And here. That's granite too. Some of it yeah, is, that's right? Part of that, that's part granite of that strip outcrop. of granite that yeah. runs across there. Well, yeah, coast. maybe that's what it is. Yeah. yeah, I think that is too, yeah. Because this is where you transition. You start transitioning here from basalt bedrock into granite. So. This is that gravel pit we've stopped at several times. Yep. Now, this is clearly a massive material that has been T take deposited us, there. Take, take it easy on the zooming in and out. <laughs> Why, what's happening? Just go a little slower so we can follow. Oh, yeah. the, the gravel pit right there? Yeah, I see it. Yeah. We've made multiple stops there. Yes. I could probably pull up some pictures of that in a minute. Yeah, it really and, shows how much debris is moving around and yeah, sloshing and swaying and yeah, just all these little fine details in the in the layering, the sediments. So here you have cat. This is called Castle Rock, and here's an unnamed cataract that was forming recessional and here you can kind of see like a mini coulee now of course if the floods had kept going castle rock would have been washed away and this would have been this coulee would have been opened into the major coulee which up here is nearly five miles wide yeah so here we're getting into this granite basement rock yeah and 
up on top of Steamboat Rock is channelization, is yeah, scab land type. And there's an erratic up there, right? That's one of the things we go see when we climb it. Yeah. Let's yeah. see. Where is that erratic? Well, it's hanging right on the uh, southern lip of it. Right in here? No, farther, farther south. Well, there's an erratic there, it looks like. Yeah, south, right on, right on the. But this right here, that's it. Let's see right if here. I can. It's at the end of that's... that little trail. Yeah, yeah, we we can see it because we know where it is. But right. yeah, it's hard to see. Yeah, because of the. Is this the erratic here? No, there's a little no. trail, farther south. Go left, 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 left. Down. There's the trail. So not that trail. There's one. That's the trail. That's the trail going up. Yeah. We're we're not on the top. Get to the very top. Surface Up here. There. No, south. South. Oh, south down this way. And then down. Yeah. No. You yeah. Were so now close. you're close. Go to the right along that edge. Right. Okay. Yeah. You can see the, the trail. Right. You can see the trail going out to it. There's a little oh, right white there, dot. Right there. Right there. Right there. There it is. That's it. He found it. Yes. Uh, <laughs> giant granite boulder yeah. sitting on top just, of it just hanging right on almost on the edge yeah. like 20 feet from the edge so look you've got a channel forming up here now that channel would have formed that would have been pre coolie northrop canyon would have been post coolie right does that make sense because look the first thing you're going to have here is before the down cutting of the coolie the water is look all the way up here erosion all the way over here if I zoom out, you can see, look here where the where the where the line is. So this was a high water mark right here. And then over here, it's obscured because you probably had water. This this is uh this is probably Foster Creek here. Well, that's Foster Creek going going uh west there. So yeah, yeah. kind of split. So Foster is the one to the west, and Barker goes to the east into the Grand Coulee. Right. So when you start going that water's rushing over the top of this it begins carving and you can see look there's channels and and kind of butte like formations here and that's what was going on out here with steamboat rock but then once grand coulee was down cut far enough all of the water then flowed through grand coulee and at that point then this channel right here would have been left high and dry let's see if i can't spin around right here this channel right here so just as a teaser for the tours that we do that the grand coulee is like the finale day it's 50 miles and we go up there and uh, make multiple stops and then we see the grand coulee dam and then hike up to the top of steamboat rock and uh lots of photo opportunity there on that erratic looking down Grand Coulee at sunset. It's really quite spectacular. So that's like the last thing we do on the trip. Yeah. And we went to, let's see, Grand Coulee Dam Visitor Center. Let's see, where is the, ah, there it is, Crown Point. Yep. This is one of our regular stops. This right here is a giant sundial. We kind of figured out how it worked, but this gives you a grand view of the top of the of the coulee let's spin it around here you can see here's the dam and here's 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 what's called the great notch and this is the head of the coulee and so the water's flowing down here you can see um Oops, you can see uh, Steamboat Rock down there in the distance. Let me get that back around. Steamboat Rock. Let's come up here and then zoom out a little so people can get the picture. Yeah, so here's the Great Notch, as it's called. And with, with Google Earth, you can see really nice and clear where the high water mark was. Yeah. And then look right here. You can see the high water mark transitions and begins to form a cliff right here yeah it's a 
pretty amazing story. And then you come over here and there's your Telford Scabland tract. Now, of course, the conventional explanation is that the Telford, the Cheney Palouse, they all came from over here. And I seriously question that assumption, that water flowing out here, down through the basin of Ponderay, out to Spokane Valley. It looks like it would make sense that that water would have created Cheney Palouse. But when you come over here to Telford, that to me starts getting questionable. And I would argue that the most likely source of the water creating Telford was the deglaciation, the rapid melting of the Columbia Valley all in here, which was probably a mile thick of ice that is now gone, right? I mean, that's a given. Nobody's going to dispute that there was not thousands of feet of ice filling the Columbia Valley up here. Nobody's going to dispute that it's now gone. Nobody's going to dispute that that ice had to melt in order to now be gone. When it melted, where would it go? Well, it just thinks the, the, the Occam's razor right here. You can see it just would have flowed out this way and created this scab land track right here. And it, and it does seem so obvious. And you look at the maps and you, you go there and you follow the water flows and it's like, okay, why? Why are they seeking another explanation? Why would they avoid this obvious one? I don't know. It's really a conundrum that we've that we've kind of been facing since the very first trips. It's like, wait a second, this just here it is on the map. But and don't look into Canada. These are American features. Yeah, don't don't look into Canada. Re disregard that two mile thick ice sheet. <laughs> Oops. And so here's the Cooley monocline that we've talked about so much coming in and then it crosses right here. So this is where the water, see, now this is, let me go back to the 2D here. We'll pull out and here you can see the Withrow mooring really clearly. So this marks the Southern terminus of the Okanagan lobe right here. So this, this was all ice. And then you can see the ice came up here and we can actually find the edge of the ice because there's a deep coulee that was an ice marginal channel that is now occupied by Alta Lake. And if we go back to, if I do this there, now you can see right here. So here's picture the ice is covering all of this. And then here's the edge of the ice right here. And you'll notice if I can go down even more that pre flood, this was a continuous landscape across here, but now you can see where it's been gouged out and the cliff right here marks the edge, the Western edge of the Okanagan lobe which came down this way. So you can picture meltwater flowing along the edge. It's see there was a trough here. You had this ice lobe here that would have been hundreds of feet thick right here. And then probably a thousand feet thick or more out here over the, the center of it. And then you had the mountains. So there was a natural trough formed right here. That would have been a natural channel for meltwater flowing from the North coming down and cutting Alta Cooley, and you can follow the pathway of the water right through here, continues down, and it flowed, it's constricted here, and you can see how it trunc truncated the sides of the hills right here. You see that? And then you can just keep following the path of the water right on down, and then it flows out here and becomes this big flat area of debris right here. But there's also it continues through here. You see this? Look, pothole right there. Oh, yeah. Continues on down, and then you get out here to this part of the Great Bench. And then Chelan Butte, one of the places we went as a bonus, is an amazing overlook. I believe this is it right up here. A uh, little, little south. Uh, more, more. You're, you're gonna have to move the screen. Oh yeah, I'm on the wrong side of Chelan. So here yeah. we are. There you go. 
uh, the hang glider. Hang glider. Yeah. yeah. Right. So we were, we went right up to here. So that gives you an amazing perspective over the Columbia Valley and down onto the Great Terrace. You see this flat shelf down here. That's all a legacy of the gigantic flows that are choked with sediment flowing through this valley at the final stages of the flood. Yeah, so as these tours morph and people want to see more of the territory, um, I'll be putting together a, a itinerary that'll basically base out of Chelan right there at the lake. All right. Uh, uh, and so these stuff, things that he's showing us now, we'll actually be able to include on one of the tours. They're, they're a little bit far away to get to from where we're based out at Soap Lake now. But yeah, there's plenty, plenty of things to, uh, you know, take up multiple days around that Great Bend and the Great Terrace and as oh, yeah. showed, Alta Lake and the Okanagan and uh, the, uh, yeah, on, on and on down into the Wenatchee Erratic and um, yeah, so many amazing things to see out there. Well, Randall, we got a bunch of questions. Should we start tackling some of these? Let's tackle some questions. Okay. First one from Alex, $21.60. Thank you, Alex. Alex says, could you say more about the dragon symbol? Says, I see parallels with square and compass, divine, adrogyne, unity of duality, above, below, masculine, feminine, earth, heaven, hidden, clear, inner fire, seven stars, seven headed, Naga related. So, yeah, the basic question is, could you say more about the dragon symbol? Yeah, well, I mean, that's a multifaceted symbol. I think it has a celestial and a terrestrial dimension to it. Um, that's where I was going to go back to, let's see. If I yeah. Can... So it's like, there has to be a sense of what a dragon is before you name a constellation Draco, right? Yeah. So mm -hmm. those, whatever they are, has to go way, way back. All right. Then, um, let's see what I can, uh. Pull up here uh, and look at Ancient Legacy. Let's see if I can't find something about dragons. Now, clearly, uh, yeah, if we look at this, All right, let's see if I can't do another screen share here. Well, let me just throw this in as you're searching for that. Just, you know, the, the events and the things that we're mentioning, always check the descriptions. I've got links, you know, to the tours, to the events, to the conferences, whatever's coming up. Um, there's, there's links in the description to the video. All right, are we seeing this from the Mexican Codex? Yes. All right, meteor as a cosmic serpent. So this was certainly, uh, you know, prevalent in Central and South America. This idea of depicting meteors, comets, etc., as serpents. It was also very uh, prevalent in Europe. This is uh, Theatricum Theatrum Cometicum in 1667. And this was a traditional European depiction of a comet as a cosmic serpent. And here's another one depicting a meteor as a descending dragon. Just a black and white version of the same thing. Oh, yeah. But here's this this is the, the interesting, you know, getting us back to the Hopewellian culture and the monumental earthworks. This is um <clears throat> Serpent Mound, the, the largest extant serpent mound complex in North America. To my knowledge, uh, there may be remnants of others that are even larger, but as far as in pr more or less pristine condition, um, although it is worn down considerably from what it would have been originally, but there's an astronomical component that I'm not showing on here, um, but that has to do with the um, the orientation, the the coils. There, the axial lines of these coils are astronomically significant. In fact, I could probably... I'm pretty sure know, they are the... Um, what is it? The, the maximum and minimum lunar standstills. 
Well, I believe I have it right here. Uh, let's go back to ancient architecture, earthwork. Here we go. Um, let's see. I think I might have. So does it, it seems like the, your basic answer to the question is that a lot of the dragon symbolism may be commentary. Celestial. Celestial oh yeah. And now with the yeah. Hopewell paper, I'm more convinced than ever. However, I'm not going to limit it sure. because like I said, there's a, think about the dragon. The dragon is both terrestrial. It sleeps in underground layers. It it sleeps in caves, right? And yeah. when it awakens, it comes out of its cave and it flies up to the heavens. Mm. So the dragon itself has a dual nature. It's both terrestrial and celestial. I'm going to pull up something, another screen share here. Um, well, the the better visual, right, goes the other way though. It comes from it comes from space and it dives in and it ends up in its cave. Yep. It's right. It makes hole. a layer full of precious metals. Yeah. That yeah. it yeah. sleeps on. <laughs> and jewels. Crystals yes. and beautiful jewels. Yeah. There you go. Exactly. And if you disturb it, it's volcanoes. So here was the Portsmouth works, <laughs> um, which is almost completely erased. A little bit of this down here still exists. And the central mound right here still exists. It's in a park in uh, downtown Portsmouth. The ring structure is gone, but the whole length here, this is over five miles, right? And it crosses the Ohio River twice. And certainly this western side has a serpentine look. Yes. And maybe it did represent a giant serpent. Hmm. And a giant serpent perhaps associated because there are legends just like with the Nile River being a, a representative of the Milky Way to to indigenous peoples that lived here, the Ohio River kind of stood the same symbolism. Yeah, I was gonna say I think that's in Kentucky, right? That yeah, the, the wheel there's in Kentucky because you're on the south side of the Ohio River there. Yeah, yeah. Let's see if I can. This is good. Stansbury Hagar among the thousand groups of earthworks. I think that's the first one. Let's see. Uh, yeah, the Portsmouth works. Till about a century ago, a series of earthworks approximating 10 miles in length extended through the city of Portsmouth, Ohio, the adjacent country on the east, and two parts of Kentucky across the Ohio River. These earthworks were constructed by the unknown pre-Columbian people whose remains covered the Ohio and Mississippi Valleys and a large part of the adjoining states. These constructions have now been entirely destroyed except a horseshoe-shaped mound preserved by the wisdom and generosity of Dr. Hempstead and a group of small mounds near the center of the main avenue, some formless remains in the nearby cemetery and the square at the western end. But the plan of the works has been definitely established by three independent surveys made by competent surveyors while the works were still complete or nearly so, and these surveys agree except in minor details. Among the thousand group of earthworks erected by the mound builders, the plan of the Portsmouth works is unique. Most of all of them, it challenges attention by the striking peculiarity of its design. It suggests to the eye the figure of a gigantic serpent curving like a bow from the four circles at its head to the square and smaller avenues at its tail which are almost due west of the head. Apparently, then, our only recourse is to ascertain whether the plan of the works reveals a definite design. If so, what was its significance, and does that significance provide an adequate motive to explain the enormous labor expended on the works as a whole? The total length of the main avenue is represented by Squire and Davis's plan, and including the avenues at the tail, is about eight miles. But if we include the missing parts of the avenue, which doubtless have been destroyed, and the two crossings of the Ohio River, its length is 10 miles. The secondary avenues at the head and center and the walls of the four circles and the crescent mound contributed about six miles to the length of the earthworks, so that if we double the length of the avenue, 
for the double wall and add the earthworks just named, the total length of the earthworks in the, in the works was over 24 miles. Wow. The dimensions of the works indicate the tremendous labor involved in their construction by a people who, to the best of our knowledge, conveyed thither the whole of the necessary earth in wicker baskets. It is self-evident that no such labor would or could be expended without some adequate motive and that the works were not haphazard constructions, but had some definite significance associated with that motive. And here's another depiction. This is from Squire and Davis, their, their version of it. And here you see the multi-ring structure here. And you can see the, the double wall extending coming across the river here, coming up to this odd little connect collection of circular looks like features a, here. Looks like a, uh, the, a diagram of the solar system or something with those rings and mounds and stuff around a central circle. Yeah. Well, yes. Doesn't it, though? I mean, it is suggestive for sure. Well, we got a bunch more questions. This okay, is awesome. so let me yeah. let me conclude this question know, by it's, saying it's that yeah, there is a. Uh, let's just quick jump back to um, the other the other one that I was looking at here. Um, I don't want to leave this guy yet. I want to show because this gets into the terrestrial um, explanation for the dragon. Um, the the codex the the Maya symbol there you started with. Uh, no, I was going to no, show. Okay, I was going to show the um. I was going to show the uh, serpent mound. Um. Well, I'm just letting people know in the chats. We got a ton okay. of questions backed up, so. Okay. Well, sure we can we'll, go on to some not other sure questions. We'll be able to get then. to all of them. Just letting you guys know. All right. Well. Okay. But. W no, yeah, Whatever we get to, it's going to be interesting stuff. Uh, Juicy, interesting stuff. So, absolutely. Um, uh, okay, so oh, we'll do this one share screen because this is so awesome. Okay, so we got this right here now? Yes. The overview of the, of the serpent. Mm -hmm. Well, the one thing I wanted to show, in, it, because to make the point about the terrestrial connection, is that if you look at this, there's a, the, there's a correlation between the serpent itself, but the landform that it's built upon, it's built on a ridge. And if looking at the ridge from above, the ridge assumes the form of a great serpent. And you can actually see the viper-like triangular head of the serpent right here. It even has eyes. The, the, the fact that there's a confluence of water courses right here is very significant, I think, because one of the things that we'll see over and over again is this, um, is the presence of water, the association of water. And upcoming early next year, we're going to do a series of, of live streams where we dive into a, 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 the different topics. We're going to take a series of topics. We'll be talking about earthworks, monumental earthworks. We'll dive into... Uh, what the Chacoan culture was doing in the Southwest and look at some of the correlations between the two. We'll dive into what the Mayans were doing in the Yucatan and we'll see those correlations between the Mayans, the Chacoan culture, the Hopewellian culture. Um, but what's interesting to me here is that here, here's your terrestrial counterpart uh, is the fact that in almost hidden in the landscape itself is a giant serpent in, in the terrain, but that is not completely superfluous because that's part of something else. The Serpent Mound area is renowned for a large geological disturbance, the remnants of perhaps the most cataclysmic event ever to occur in Ohio. Serpent Mound sits on the edge of the disturbed area, which measures three and a half to four miles in diameter and covers between 12 and 15 square miles. Within the central part of the area, rocks have been thrust upward at least a thousand feet above their original position. The surrounding this area is a lower area where rocks are approximately at their normal elevations. A ring graben, which is, uh, Kyle, maybe you look up the word graben for us. 
where rocks have been down dropped forms the outer portion of the structure. Here, the ground surface is higher in elevation, but the bedrock has been dropped down as much as 400 feet. So think about that. The 1,000 plus the 400 feet, that's a, a, a differential of 14, 1,400 feet. So what happened here? This was a piece of a comet that struck Ohio. And I somebody chose the rim of this astro, ancient astrobling to erect this gigantic serpent effigy. I just find that very interesting. I, dude, me too. I can't wait. I've never been there and I'm, I can't wait to go. That's oh, we're like, definitely, definitely going to be doing it. We're going to be doing a Hopewell and a, 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 a Earth Monumental Earthworks tour. Absolutely. No doubt. Yeah. There's, yep. there's a reason Brad and I have spent many miles and dollars exploring and documenting these things over the years. Not so we could just sit here and say, Hey, we went there and saw this, but <laughs> no, because we want to take people there. We want to educate people about this extraordinary episode in the history of ancient America. Okay. Let's get on to some other questions. Robin is a usually elongated depression between geologic faults. Say it again. It is a, a usually elongated depression between geologic faults or a trough like area caused by the down throw of a crustal fault block or an elongated block of the Earth's crust that has dropped relative to the surrounding blocks. So there we go. So he, he used the term a ring graben. Mm, okay. So you've got this ringed trough that dropped 400 feet. And you had another central area that was upthrust by 1,000 feet. The interesting thing about this was this occurred literally in a matter of seconds. Yeah. We're not looking at, you know, millions of years or hundreds of thousands of years. We're looking at literally seconds. The thing that's crazy too about this, the the presence of that mound is that it, it seems obvious that they knew what it was. Yeah. This feature that most people that probably are go to the area, you can't even see how do they you know what I'm saying? It's like Yeah. You don't know, do that know that there it's there. An there. Yeah. But they knew that it was there and knew what it was. Yeah. Based on that mound, somehow. Based on that mound, yeah. That's what that well, let me just, me away. Let me let me add in here just to back up Randall. I mean, we do want to take people to these places. I've I've got a, a short list of uh, itinerary tours I want to pull together, and the the Earthworks is definitely one of them. So they're all the way from basically central Ohio uh, along the Ohio River down to the Mississippi. Uh, the largest complex is. Uh, just across the Mississippi River from St. Louis, going down into Louisiana. There's records of over 700 different earthwork complexes in Louisiana. Now, obviously, we can't do all that in in a week, but uh, and it wouldn't be one where we base out of and just go out each day. We'd we'd kind of follow the rivers, um, but that is one of the itineraries uh, prioritized that I'm going to be putting together for us. So. All right. Awesome, man. Maybe not next year, but uh, yeah, certainly, certainly soon. We wanna, we wanna be able to make that available to show those to people. Yep. Okay. Uh, so T Gear gave twenty bucks twice. So we'll go through both of the comments. So the first one just says five pointed star question mark. So I'm not sure what that question is, but the second one says Bimini Road. I have taken photos of small rocks in a creek that looks exactly like Bimini Road. So could a very large, large water flow have made Bimini Road? You know, I, I, I haven't studied Bimini Road to have any definitive opinions other than my thought is it certainly could be natural. Yeah. Um, I, I haven't made up my mind. You know, what what is the depth of Bimini Road? Um, yeah, I was just going to say, it's, you know, it's probably it's it's shallow. Less than, it's yeah. less than 100. I think it's like 60-some feet. So, you know, thinking about the Ice Age, yeah, it was, yeah. Less than it that. was quite yeah. elevated. Uh, it wasn't underwater at that time for yeah. sure. Yeah, I haven't seen the latest, if there have been latest studies, I, you know, whether that could uh, determine whether or not it's natural or um, or artificial. I honestly don't know. But being only 100 foot or so below sea level, it certainly would have been above ground during the Ice Age. Yeah. yeah. And for those of, of you guys out there who've watched my Atlantis thing, one of the the, the the things that I argue is that, um, you know, it's very possible that we're looking at colonies and right. colonies would have been natural to be along the Eastern United States, the Eastern seaboard, along Cuba, um, 
you know, as far as the Western hemisphere goes. Um, so, Hey, I don't know, but I certainly don't reject the idea that there could have been, you know, part of the, like that, when you, when you get into, you know, you know uh, is it Yonaguni yep. off the coast of Japan? Yeah. That's the, one of the controversies there. Um, is it natural or artificial? Now, my thought is, well, it could have been natural, but it could have been modified. Modified. Yeah. Yeah. And maybe it the kinda same. kind of looks like a quarry. Yeah. You got any. Bit. It, uh, yeah. Know. Yonaguni does. Yes. That's what I mean. Yeah. yeah Yonaguni. Yeah. Bimini Road is interesting too, but yeah, I don't know. I mean, it, it could be natural, but yeah, well, I don't if think you guys it's... remember, what was it Canyon Lake Gorge down there? We went to see with you guys in Texas. Canyon Lake yes. Gorge, is that right? Yeah. Right. So we we had a geologist, uh, actually like three or four geologists with us that morning on that tour, and and they had said, well, yeah, once we get farther down to the bottom, you'll see where these, um, these these faults and these cracks are very regular and, and yeah, square, whatever the word, quadrilateral, I forget what they said, but um, there there were quite a few that were very regular squares. Yeah. You know, yeah. Totally natural. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. So I mean, those things do occur. Yes, they do. Okay, so here, see, I'm finding a few pictures of the B B Bimini Road. Um, actually, this is a video, but it's still, you can kind of um, see it. I'll just pl play it here. Yeah, I think it's in, like, 20 feet of water it's not very deep at all yeah no, it's not deep right it's not yeah. Deep. yeah less than 40 but yeah i think uh looking at some of that stuff it would have had to have some hellish uh, shock absorbers whoops oh for a road yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah they didn't have the wheel back then brad <laughs> <laughs> They were so moving thousand ton stones, but they did skids. not have the wheel. Yeah. Everyone knows that. <laughs> oh, then they're then they're segueing over to Yonaguchi. Yonaguni. Yonaguni, I mean. Yonaguni. Um Okay. Right, so we'll anyways, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. I'm we looking got, at the We got a bunch of questions to go through. So okay, let's, let's keep going. Thomas. But that was that was something well, yeah. Be quiet, Brad. <laughs> Thomas <laughs> Thomas Springfield gives five bucks. Thank you, Thomas. And there's kind of two questions in here. It says, Randall, will you explain what the mouth of Ra is on Mount Ararat? And what you mean by what if humans have already left the earth before and maybe they built other kinds of arcs? Oh, <laughs> well, now there is a question <laughs> that would require a few hours minimum to answer. <laughs> However, ah. now who is this from? This is Good from question. Thomas. Thomas, it's coming, man. I'm working on it. But, you know, some of this stuff has still been classified, and I'm yeah. only releasing it as I, um, well, let's say as I feel like it's okay to release it. Um, but what about the mouth? What was the question regarding the mouth of Ra? Can, yeah. What, can, will you explain what the mouth of Ra is on Mount Ararat? Well, I think that's that arc-like shape structure. I think that's probably is he talking thing. about the air at anomaly? Is that what that is? Is that Thomas from Michigan that was just on tour with us? Do we know have any way? No, it that? says Thomas Springfield. Oh no, different guy. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh hmm. Well, you know, that's the the is it what is it, the Drupinar Drupinar feature that I think he's probably referring to. If he was on a tour, dude, the rule is what happens on the tours stays <laughs> on the tours. Uh, yeah. Okay. So, um, tell you what I'm going to do here, I believe what he's talking about is going to be this thing right here. Oh, uh, at, yeah. It's not actually, if, if, if I'm correct, it's not both, actually. They're both on, arc related questions. So they are supposed to be related the mouth of Ra on Ararat and what do you mean by people built other kinds of arcs and left the earth um oh that's just wild speculation is that, is that a <laughs> quote from a particular podcast I guess I wonder where he's 
Yeah, I don't know yeah, where that came from. from. Yeah. He doesn't say. Yeah. All right. Are we seeing this? Yes. I believe this is what he's talking about. As referring to it as the mouth of Ra. Uh, I would think so too, yeah. So what is that anomalous looking thing right there? Mm. It's a drumlin. Well, it's not exactly a drumlin. <laughs> Here you can see another view of it. Yeah, that is interesting. Yeah. So it has been proposed that it was, uh, you know, the Ark. It's not on Mount Ararat, but it is in the foothills of Ararat. Yeah. And when you look at the, let's go back, look at the, look at the landscape that it's sitting in. It looks highly eroded, doesn't it? It does. Yeah, and even possibly like it was mud flows. Okay, yeah. so wait, yeah, yeah, Thomas, yeah. Thomas in the chat just responded. He says he got this from Geocosmic Rex Cosmology 101 at 3333. Uh, no. <laughs> that was a long video. Was 33 long video. minutes yeah, and yeah. 33 seconds yeah. you said so that. So he's basically referencing an old Geocosmic Rex video that Brad has posted on YouTube. Uh-huh. Yeah, oh, Brad, huh? Yeah, it's Brad is <laughs> the one. <laughs> Busted. A couple pre-release releases by Randall. <laughs> Well, yeah, so I haven't made up my mind. This is in Turkey. Um, the Turkish government says that this is the remains of Noah's Ark. Hmm. The Turkish government, okay. Yeah, they've designated this as I believe them. A They're a government. Yeah, here, <laughs> here's a ground. they say. <laughs> Where's the hotels? <laughs> well, look at this thing. Wow, now, have you cool. ever seen the work of David Fassold? Any of you guys? No. So David Fassold uh, was a uh, merchant marine, and he did some interesting studies. I'll back up here a little bit. And let's see. Well, that's a sizable craft if somebody built it. So here's the earliest ship building uh, technique in the world that is known using papyrus reeds. Are you seeing this picture? Yeah. Okay, good. So this, uh, let's see. They also build okay. those in South America. Yes. Yeah. And here's it in South America. Okay, yeah. Reed boats. Yes. Okay, so Thor, remember Thor Heyerdahl? Yep. Oh, yeah. Practical research into ancient type of types of watercraft leads one upon many untrodden trails. It led me to remote islands in Polynesia, lakes in the Andes, and Central Africa, and rivers and coasts of all the continents. Lastly, it brought me to what was formerly Sumer, today the home of the Marsh Arabs. There began my quest for human history beyond the zero hour. There began also a voyage that brought me and my companions into adventures far from those of the astronauts, back to the remote days and nights when our planet was still big. So big it was in those times that unknown and unforeseen worlds alien to the voyager beckoned beyond every horizon. So he went into these, and then he attempted actually to build here he is building uh, a reed boat with which he was going to sail across the ocean. They're assembling, they're bundling the reeds together. Here they're tying wow. up the bundles of reeds That's before awesome. assembling into a boat. <coughs> now check this out. Wow. B building the tigress, wooden jigs assembled to hold the reed bundles in the proper position. Wow, that's there awesome. We... Pretty amazing, isn't it? Can sail across the Atlantic on grass. So there they go. Look at this. That's a great shot, isn't it? Yeah, that it? is a good shot. Wow. Look at that. They're, they're transporting the reed boat there across the Giza Plateau to launch it. So they didn't quite make it. 
However, they didn't fully use the biblical uh, instructions. The biblical proportions, huh? No, well, what they didn't do well, was, there's no and animals. I'm sorry about this, but my, uh, <laughs> oh, well, let's see here. Uh, Teba was the ark. Let's see if I can go back a little bit here to the work of David Fassold. Here's from the Genesis. Make thee an ark of gopher wood. Rooms shalt thou make in the ark, and shalt pitch it within and without with pitch. This is what Fassel, I mean, what Thor Heyerdahl didn't do. If he'd used the pitch, he probably would have been able to make it completely across the uh. ocean. <laughs> and this is the fashion which thou shalt make it of. The length of the ark shall be 300 cubits, the breadth of it 50 cubits, and the height of it 30 cubits. Of course, what was the cubit they were using? So then David Fassold, writing in 1988, as a shipmaster, I was haunted by the reality that the largest wooden ships that were ever built, the six-masted schooners from 1900 through 1909, convinced the builders that 300 feet was the absolute limit for the fiber stress of this material. Ships approaching this figure deformed through hogging and sagging to where they visibly undulated over the waves. They were constantly in need of pumping and had to be strapped in iron to keep them together. In the end, John Rockwell, the designer of this class of vessel, was forced to admit that wooden boat building had reached its limit. The ships were used only for short hauls and the coast trade since they were considered unsafe in deep water. The 329-foot Wyoming needed another 186 feet to meet the ARC's requirement. So what's his point here? Well, that it was impossible to build a wooden ship 450 feet long, assuming the standard Hebrew cubit of, of 18 inches, 300 feet in length would have been 450 feet. Yeah. So either we reject the idea that the ark was built of wood, but the King James translation says it was built of gopher wood. So the question is, is what? kind of wood is gopher wood and is it in fact wood mm. that's that's the question mm -hmm. now we're not going to get into this only because when i trans uh when i moved this from my previous computer over to this computer oh yeah my he hebrew font didn't come through so i have to re <laughs> can you I read that to... for us i want to hear you read it <laughs> yeah <laughs> Well, I was going to get uh, Kyle to. <laughs> okay, but, so, but we can actually see something right up here. Look at the arc you make. And here's Teba. See, Teba right here. Um, that's the word read from right to left. You have Tau, Bet, uh, Chet, He, Teba is the arc. And then over here, Gimel, Pe, Resh, which is, trans which is in the King James, which is go the gopher wood. GPR, gopher, go gimel pay resh. Here it's being translated as cypress, cypress, cypress okay. wood. But I think that's the key right there. If we if we understand what gopher wood, and I think the key is right in that word itself. But really, this is going to be uh material. I mean, we're kind of diving in as sort of a a a, a sneak preview. Okay. Of, some of the kind of stuff that we would be getting into. Um, well, let's because for one thing, yeah, I've got to have the, I've got to have the, um, the Hebrew, but I'll, I'll just show this real quick. Here's your Gimel, Pei, Resh, Gimel, Pei, and Resh is the, the three Hebrew words. Gopher from an unused root probably means to house in a kind of tree or wood as used for building, apparently the cypress. Okay. Okay, so we'll leave it at that, and I'll show, at some point, I'll be showing why it wasn't wood. Okay? All right. Well, let's see if we can tackle at least one more question here. Before yeah. We, before we finish, we got 10 minutes left. Okay, let me stop share. Stedman Rutherford, 100 bucks. Thank you very much. Says, uh, you've Thank you. You've spoke to the astronomical significance of July 4th, 1776. 
Curious if the Nova event known as SN-1056 is what you're referring to. It was first reported to be visible in the daytime sky on July 4th. Note these events were exactly 720 years apart. Thanks, guys. Yeah, that 1056 event, maybe, maybe. However, I think the significance of, you know, wouldn't have been our the same as our uh, Gregorian calendar, obviously. But, you know, if, if, if our calendar is based upon... Um, the, the the equinoxes and the solstices then you know basically what we would be saying is that july 20 july 4th comes what a couple of weeks after summer solstice right so rather than saying well july 4th back in the egyptian days if we say several weeks after the summer solstice right well that date seems like it coincides with the heliacal rising of sirius which was the mm. harbinger of the inundation of the Nile river. So here's a whole nother thing. Again, I've got this list of about a dozen topics that, to, that I would really like to dive into as we go forward. One of them is going to be the tradition of the dog star Sirius and the symbolism of all of that, the importance of that to the Egyptians, to the Dogons, to other, uh, cultures. Cause there was Sirius was, was of, uh, paramount significance to a lot of the ancient cultures and it is the brightest star in our sky and it has a lot of interesting mythology associated with it so diving into that would be a very interesting thing to do and that is on my list of topics um so w read the question to me one more time okay so you you spoke to the astronomical significance of July fourth, seventeen seventy six. Curious if the Nova, Nova event known as SN ten fifty six is what you're referring to. The answer would be no. That's not what I was referring to. Okay. But but that's an interesting correlation for sure. Uh, it says note these events were exactly seven hundred and twenty years apart. Which events? I, I, the the ten seventy six and the seventeen seventies or ten. Oh, 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 yeah, in the founding of America. Exactly yeah. 720 years apart. Yeah, yeah, okay. Would have been I'm not sure what to make, make of that, but that's... Uh, that's uh, interesting. Yeah. Synchronicity. Synchronicity. All right. Okay. This is from someone unseen. 50 bucks. 50 Australian bucks, I think. Randall and crew. No, that's not Australian. What is that? Not sure. Okay. Hi, Randall and crew. What's your take on the ruins at La Palma, the Canary Islands? There is a vid on YouTube by Bushcraft Bear exploring ruins on the shore. If you haven't seen them, it's worth a look. P.S. Yeah. Still waiting for moon info. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, okay. It's from UK, maybe. There's a flag there. I can't tell what it is. So the ruins on La Palma suggest to me that, the, obviously, that there were inhabitants of those islands prior to the arrival of the Spaniards, clearly. I would not necessarily attribute them to Atlantis per se, um, merely that maybe somewhere between three and 5,000 years ago, there were other visitors to those islands, which I totally think is, is plausible, and that Spaniards were late arrivals. So that, that would be my take on, on the pyramids there. Um, I don't know if I, I don't remember if I got into, I had some images of some of the, the, the stone works there comparing them, for example, to some of the stone structures on Malta mm. and they look very, very similar. Uh, ziggurats. Yeah. Ziggurat step, like step, step, step pyramids. pyramids step yes. Pyramids, right. Now, clearly we know that from habitation of islands in the Mediterranean going back, I mean, there's evidence of human habitation of islands in the Mediterranean going back over 30,000 years. What does that suggest? Well, it suggests that somebody 30,000 years ago at least had enough navigational competence to sail from the mainland out to islands in the Mediterranean. Now, it's not too big of a stretch from there to assume that maybe they could sail west from Portugal and hit the Canaries or Madeira or the Azores. Um, that, to me, there's nothing implausible or fringe about that idea. And I think the finding of those uh, those step pyramids uh, and the Azores and or the Canaries rather um, is evidence that that there were people visit at least visiting 
I don't know of any evidence that people were ever actually having any uh, habitations there or settlements, mm. but they were clearly visiting. Yeah. All right. Should we tackle what one else more? We, what else we got? One uh, more. So, Andrew, 20 bucks, and maybe continuing on with the Canary Island. So, Canary Island Maternal Genetics, question mark. Your Atlantis series video, your Atlantis series video cut off prior to discussing this information. And two, Plato's Atlantis, evidence for advanced technology, Poseidon giving his wife five twins. Could this be a sign of artificial fertilization? Mm, interesting. I hadn't really considered that. Now, um, the fact of of advanced technology, I, I got to drop something here. Um, we are coming upon something here. I think in in you know somebody asked about the moon again. Um, I've been deliberately withholding, holding back on that for reasons which will become clear once we get into it. Um, but I, and we've talked about, you know, the younger Dryas and essentially the fact that human beings have been on this, modern human beings have been on this planet for conservatively 180,000 years, maybe going for much further than that. 200, 250, maybe a quarter million years. We don't know because as we go back, the geological record becomes very sparse. And the reason is, is because as we're now finding out, there does seem to be overwhelming evidence that there are regular periodic catastrophes that can erase a lot of what had gone before. And, you know, you juxtapose several catastrophes on top of one another and what's going to be left. It, it, not much, not much. And this is part of the reason, you know, archaeologists, I think in, in their uh, attempts to reconstruct the past, not finding the artifacts that they would assume should be there. But that assumption comes within the context of thinking of strict gradualism. Mm. You don't think about the fact that there would be periodic catastrophes that could completely annihilate the existing terrain, the existing landscape, whatever was there, completely remodeling large swaths of the Earth's surface. Now, once you begin to understand that this is an ongoing process, that it's happened repeatedly, well, now you begin to understand, well, maybe why it's so difficult to find hard evidence. But the point is, if we're projecting our own civilization, our own culture and science technology industry and imagining that that is what we should be looking for. We may be completely missing the point because there could be a technology that's as scientifically advanced as anything we've done today, or even more so that doesn't look anything like the civilization. It's an outgrowth of that scientific and technological understanding of natural processes and natural forces, the laws of nature and so on may give rise to a civilization that doesn't look anything like this present incarnation of yeah. civilization, right? And in the very near future, uh, uh, Russ and I were having a conversation a couple of days ago. We were. Yeah, and uh, there's some stuff coming down the pipeline that could completely alter the equation of our future, completely. Um it could completely upend all of our projections about what we could be, what could be um, yeah, evolving the over the next. The entire direction of civilization, yeah. yeah. The entire direction of civilization, yeah. yes. And over the next few months and into next year, I'm going to be progressively releasing some information uh, that I have been sitting on for quite a number of years now, only because I have not had a green light to disclose some of this information. Um, but I have been given essentially a pro, uh, a provisional green light. So I'm going to start getting into some of that and we're going to, we're going to go. One of the things, for example, I've said all along is that I thought for years now that for example, the Holy grail is actually a symbol for a lost technology. So I may use that imagery of the grail to dive into this possibility. But there have been a number of researchers out there in the last century or so 
who have made inroads into alternate forms of technology. We could name some names, Tesla, Nikolai Tesla, Wilhelm Reich, Walter Russell, Victor Schauberger, amongst others. In almost all of these cases, uh, a lot of this work has been suppressed for a variety of reasons, which would not necessarily be um, uh, appropriate to get into right now. We're in a different situation now. And there are researchers out there that have followed in the footsteps of these great men of science who's made these incredible discoveries only to have them suppressed. Um, but now we're in an interesting situation because this information can go out and completely bypass the normal uh, venues, uh, establishment venues. And this is what's about to happen. And when it does, it will be completely alter the equation of our future. And so uh, I know this is going to raise a lot of questions, and all I can say is bear bear with us. Yep, chat's um, freaking out. Who is? The chat is totally freaking out. <laughs> well. <laughs> They're excited. I'll just put it that way. Good, good, because so I'm excited we're, too. We're looking to deflect that direction or not agree to go in that direction? No, we're agreeing to go in that direction. Okay. But the challenge to me is to how to disseminate this information um, at the same time, minimizing the blowback that is undoubtedly going to follow because like I said, it's, it's game changing stuff. It's out there. And I've had the privilege of being a recipient of certain kinds of information that um, could, pr let's put it this way. It could blow apart that veil that separates our modern incarnation of history from 200,000 years of lost history. Yeah. And when that happens, everything changes. Everything completely changes, potentially for the better, because we're going down a dead end road right now. We are really going down a dead end road, believing that there are finite resources on this planet and whoever becomes the dominant nation is going to be able to control those resources. And we're willing to risk world war three in order to dominate the planetary resources. And we don't need to do that. We absolutely don't need to do that. And that's the significance of this release of information. All right. Well, should we wrap it up there now that you've got everybody freaking out? <laughs> Super tease. Well, Super all I can tease. say is stay stay tuned. Just stay tuned. Follow sure. everything we're going to be doing because, um, you know, I, I don't want people to just, you know, think I'm blowing hot air. You know, this is why I'm not making claims. A lot of people are out there making, you know, exuberant claims, exaggerated claims, outlandish claims about stuff, and they don't back it up. I'm taking the other approach. I'm going to release information incrementally, let people decide for themselves what the significance of this information is. Um, and of course it can all be, um, it can all be verified. Yes. So I did, I showed you Russ a little bit of it. Yeah. Some I of saw it. a little bit. I didn't understand it, but we'll see. <laughs> it was fascinating. Yes, it was. Okay. <laughs> Okay, let me thank some some of the re the rest of the people we have. Uh, P. Atlantis five bucks, B. B. Lopez twenty dollars, Cody twenty bucks, Alexander twenty dollars, Sean Sean Dunn twenty bucks, Rick R. Another hundred bucks, Alexander five dollars, Dan thirty dollars, Justin fourteen, Frank twenty, and last but not least, Peter Shell two hundred sixteen dollars for the Sanctuary Project. Thank you guys so much for all the donations. Thank I'm sorry we everyone. can't get to all your questions. Big we do our Thank best, you. but yep. uh, Randall always has really good answers, so sometimes they're long. But really appreciate that. There's like a hundred, there's sixteen hundred people in the chats right now. Really appreciate you guys. The chats are always nice. highly entertaining. Thank you all so much for. Absolutely, the live we appreciate everybody <laughs> yeah. and all the patrons out there. I want to say thank you because you guys are really helping out. And uh, it really makes me committed to doing what's necessary to try to put this information out there. And Bradley and I have been working together for quarter century now. I mean, aren't we up to a quarter century? Oh, yeah. We're that we've that been now. laboring out there to put this 
pull this information together and we spent what 22 years something like that pulling together this information and now we've got three years or so yeah. under our belt of trying to put some of this information out there and right. it's beginning to steamroll all right anything else Ooh. to add brad or are we 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 done um randallcarlson.com i'll stop oh, there yeah let yeah. me remind everybody the halloween event on october 30th tune in i've got some new information on that and uh the revenue we generate from everything that we do is going straight right back into the research um so it really helps out but yeah check all the links in the description uh the purchase page is probably going to be ready if it's not right now later tonight or tomorrow definitely uh asap um because that's coming up in two weeks so there will be no live show in two weeks because that is actually halloween monday itself right. okay um but yeah we're working on some more recorded shows there'll be one coming out soon and we got another one in the can uh ready to back that up so yeah more more full-length podcast episodes coming out also oh, wait, Kyle taking, and I got... taking a break in the clips we Kyle got uh, choppers uh, flying helicopters are circling us guys so i think Randall <laughs> might have, we're already it's the end of the game for we us. We did Randall. not kill ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> They've been flying. I don't know back anything. <laughs> uh, they're back. <laughs> all right. Uh, it's all good. Good night, guys. Good night, chat. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, guys. Good, good night, night everyone. Randall. Yeah. Thanks, everybody.